Snug, 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 snug. Yeah, yeah, I see them. Snug. I know. I know. Be very still and very quiet. Oh, hey there. Welcome to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Fatchett. If you've never listened to the show, in addition to providing you with entertaining and informative photography and business-related stuff, I also go on adventures with the crew of the Starship Fibonacci. Uh, While I have your attention, I just want to say thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Keep sharing the podcast with your friends and keep leaving reviews. It's very helpful. Anyway, at the moment, Golden Hour and I are taking photos of rare wildlife on the planet Irwinia 3 for a conservation project. Speaking of wildlife, in this episode of the show, I'm talking with wildlife photographer Rylan Meadows about tips and advice for photographing animals in their native habitat. Be sure to stay tuned for that conversation after the break. Uh oh. Snug? Well, I didn't know they could move that fast. Hey, photographers, are you ready to say goodbye to the chaos of scattered contracts, Miss Lee's? Hey, photographers, are you ready to say goodbye to the chaos of scattered contracts, missed leads, and disorganized schedules? Then you should try Pixify, your all-in-one client relationship management software that'll take your business to the next level. Pixify brings order to your business chaos by streamlining your workflow. Manage digital contracts, effortlessly track leads and clients, and organize your schedule all from one intuitive platform. Impress your clients with personalized and branded communications. From email templates to booking pages, Pixify ensures every interaction reflects your unique brand, building trust and loyalty. You can say goodbye to scheduling headaches. Pixify's scheduling tools make it easy for you to book appointments with clients and for you to keep your calendar organized. Deliver a VIP experience with personalized client portals. Your clients can access important documents, view their project progress, and interact with ease. And most importantly, no more chasing payments. Pixify automates your invoicing and payment processing, ensuring you get paid on time, every time. I've been using Pixify for over a decade, and it has saved me countless hours and a lot, a lot of money. I tried a number of other CRM options before settling on Pixify because Pixify offered the most robust set of tools that also allowed me to truly connect and foster my relationships with my my clients. I highly recommend it. And you can save 20% on annual Pixify programs when you use our link, nerdyphotographer.com slash recommends slash Pixify. You can also find that link in the episode notes. Save big money and save yourself time. Time, the one thing which you can never get back. Pixify saves me hundreds of hours every year that I can spend on tasks that make my business money or by just relaxing and getting away from work. So what are you waiting for? Visit nerdyphotographer.com slash recommends slash Pixify and save 20% today. Hello and welcome to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Fatchett. I'm here today with Rylan Meadows. And am I pronouncing that correctly? I should have asked you before we started yes, recording. Yes, you're good. That was okay. perfect. Just making sure. Uh, and Rylan is among other things, a wildlife photographer. And that's what we're going to discuss today. But before we get into that, I'm going to roll the dice breaker and it's a 19. Okay. Rylan, what camera system do you use and why is it the best? This is your chance to brag about whatever camera you use. Oh yes. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you picked this topic. Um, I'm shooting right now with a knock on Xenon. I'm very lucky to have one of those in my hands. Um, it's just such a great camera, you know, knock ons flagship right now. Um, it's got great autofocus and it's perfect for wildlife and what I use it for. It works great. Tra- they had tracking and, uh, wildlife is real important. So yeah, tell us a little bit about your journey in photography i mean you're i'm gonna say people who can't see you you're on the younger side um you're how old 18 18 uh, man the, your your photos are very good i'm just gonna let you know like we have to look through Thank your you. portfolio in my opinion as an, yeah just say but what but you know what what has been your journey in photography yeah i started photography when i was about 15 years old and so At that point, I was just trying to find what I liked. You know, I'd always liked being outdoors and stuff. You know, I'd enjoyed hiking. Um, I I used to hunt 
um, when I was younger. And so I did that a lot. So I'd be around wildlife quite a bit doing that. And so it just sort of developed into this thing, you know, COVID hit. Um, and that's when I really kind of started working on perfecting my craft. And, you know, I, I didn't know if photography was going to be something that I would want to do my whole life. Uh, and obviously now I've determined that I do. And I think a huge part of that was through COVID and working and developing my skills. Um, and like COVID, it was a terrible time. You know, it was so stressful. But I think through COVID, it truly helped me become passionate with photography. And that's just been such a huge part of my photography journey and um, learning to perfect my skills through that. It's interesting you mentioned hunting because, I mean, I grew up in the Midwest and hunting as a kid and also like, you know, not that, but the, like uh, wildlife photography is almost like hunting without the gun. It's yeah. you're, 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 you're <laughs> out there like looking for the moment and when I, the limited amount of wildlife photography that I do, uh, you know, I do different things and I have friends who avidly photograph birds you know they're like always bird watching and they get mad at me that like i go on hikes pretty regularly they're like mad that i don't take my camera with me my hikes was like oh you wouldn't believe it today i saw a bald eagle like and then and uh you know i'm just like i i probably i have uh my longest lens is my 200 millimeter i don't have anything like i don't like built really for uh, wildlife photography in that way and i'm like and i don't want to like carry a huge lens with me like oh i'm out right. just going on this is that this is my mental health break for you know like to go out there and just like be there with nature and not behind a camera and yeah. stuff like they get so mad that i'm <laughs> like you like what you have a bald eagle in your neighborhood like well yeah just uh there's a reservation over here and like <laughs> just it happened to be hanging out by the reservoir and you know there's i think it's a couple um, so yeah, that's, that's one of those things that is, uh, <laughs> interesting. so it requires such patience, uh, to photograph animals like in, in the wild, uh, and persistence. What are, what are some challenges that you face when you're photographing, you know, wildlife? You know, there's so many. Yeah. I mean, when you photograph people, you can, you know, you can pose them, you can tell them what to do. So that's a huge struggle, you know, because I can't, I can't even count the number of times I've been out in the field and I've wanted an animal to like move like this many feet to the left, this many feet to the right. I wish their head was like slightly tilted up. I wish they were looking a different direction, you know, and I mean, there's no way of controlling that. Like you're not going to be able to change that, um, which leads me into talking about patience, which it's so insanely difficult and not even like just when you're photographing the animal, like you have to be patient to wait on them to like move a certain way or like do a certain thing, which they may not even do, but the patience that you have to have to wait for an animal to show up you know, or to like actually find an animal. And I do wildlife photography, um, two different ways primarily, you know, I'll go out and I'll actually like walk around and search for like wildlife. That's not skittish, like birds or something, but like, it's not going to be a huge deal like to them. If like they get a little spooked and like fly away or something like, so I'll go out and I'll search. Um, but then another method that I use, which is actually a lot more frustrating and requires a lot more patience is actually sitting and waiting in a blind. Yeah. And that requires so much patience. You know, you can sit there for like eight hours and see absolutely nothing, or you can sit there 30 minutes and a deer will show up or a fox or something crazy. Um, and it's just, it's so inconsistent. Um, it really requires a whole lot of patience. Yeah. Sometimes it's just luck and you don't know what, yeah. what you're going to get. Um, what's going to happen. Like I was happened to be on a, uh, a trip to Scotland last year and we were in the outer Hebrides, which are these islands on the, off the West coast of Scotland. And we were about to have dinner at this, uh, fishing lodge that we were staying at that they've turned into a bed and breakfast. And two of the other guests were like, there's deer outside. And I was like, I'm like, Oh, there's two stags like out, you know, like walking down the, the side of the hill, like past this fishing lodge. So I, again, I had had my uh, longer lens with me and I just like ran outside and I was surprised. I guess they have no natural predators, but I was able to like on the island, there's nothing there like wow. that's going to attack them. So they don't spook like so much wow. unless you're getting like pretty close. Um, 
so I was able to like kind of like slowly, calmly, as long as I wasn't like I wasn't running at them, but like slowly and calmly like sort of trot over to like where the fence was and like lean over and get some shots of them like running and like jumping over this stone wall. Um because the two drunk Scotsmen who were staying at the same place came running up behind me like, Oh my God, look at that. Um, but yeah, it's sometimes it's just luck. Sometimes you, you, you plan and you prepare and you get yourself out there and nothing happens at all. And then other times, like you said, you could be there, you're there 15 minutes and every animal in the woods shows up like you're snow white for some reason. (laughs) Yeah. Like, so in that sense, like what can you say about like, what, what is the most memorable experience or encounter you've had while out uh shooting wildlife photos you know i i've had a lot of memorable experiences but um uh, two immediately come to mind uh when you ask that question and neither one of them i'm actually like at my home you know i i do a primary primarily i photograph uh in kentucky where i live and i just kind of work around the farm and you know and take pictures of wild turkey and deer and birds and you know just photograph what's around me and that's why anyone should do um if they want to improve but i think one of the most memorable moments for me was actually um in the south uh entrance of yellowstone i got to photograph some bison and their calves um and they were just kind of out there jumping and prancing around and and it was golden hour and the lighting was just perfect and it was so pretty um and i don't think i'm ever going to forget that and then another really memorable experience for me was uh when i got to photograph a black bear for the first time out in the wild you know i'd I'd seen them before i've seen bears out in the wild before but it was like it was before i was 15 so i wasn't doing photography (laughs) or anything yet um so i got to photograph a black bear with three cubs um in I believe it was Scatlinburg, Tennessee. Um, I was in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, and I mean, they were just like feet outside of my car. It was like such an <laughs> incredible experience. It's also like the, when you see a bear here, you like kind of immediately there's like the, the hair goes up and you're like, yeah, yeah what, what's going on here? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's the uh, eye opening moment. Um, so you mentioned patience as you know, something that's really important. And the other thing you just mentioned, like think, photographing the things that are near you. I think that a lot of people don't, when it comes to like practicing, they don't think there's a lot. I see a lot of times in photography forums online where people are like going, Oh man, I wish I could go to this place or I could go to that place. And, I, and you need to find the things that are local to you to work on your skills and improve. You can always be improving yourself and you know just practicing and getting out and taking pictures but what do you think are some essential skills that people who want to do wildlife photography should focus on developing and improving their photos you know in in terms of photographically it's really important to kind of understand the exposure triangle which sounds so cliche to say but um shutter speed is like one of the most important things when you're photographing an animal um, cause you know, if it could take off running, you're going to need to be able to immediately adjust that shutter speed. So like, it's not blurry or if they take off flying, you know, um, so the exposure triangle is really important. Um, kind of moving outside of like technical advice, it's really important to understand the animal. Um, you're going to want to understand their behaviors. You know, obviously they're not 100% predictable and you can't know every fact about every animal that you're going to take a picture of, but if you can know some general, like common sets of behaviors, like don't approach them like (laughs) this fast or like, don't get this close to them. You know, uh, it's just important to kind of understand what you're working with. Uh, cause you don't want to go out in the field to like, you know, photograph a deer and just like run towards it. And then just like (laughs) try try to like walk up to it, you know, it's going to scare it away. Um, which is bad for the animal and it's going to prevent you from getting a good photograph. Uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's going to also, you you can put yourself in danger that way. Yeah. Uh, if you don't understand, uh, the behaviors because y- you can, what you're doing may come off as aggressive or as some sort of challenge yeah. to an animal, like even deer. I don't think that people, That's some people true. are like how dangerous, like especially bucks can be. Yeah. Like, you can get stabbed by a deer and gored, um, yeah. by some antlers and like, you know, get out into like bigger, like elk, moose, 
elk and moose are real dangerous. Yeah. Um, they'll just stomp on you. Um, yeah. And I think a bison too, you yeah. know, out in Yellowstone every year you think, I mean, you hear of somebody getting gored by a bison cause they've tried to get too close and it's, it can be really dangerous. Well, they're just dumb and they like, jump fences yeah. too. And they're like, Oh, I'm yeah. just going to get close to this, yeah. this wild animal. And they get take a selfie with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's a <laughs> wild animal. And even like, I'm sorry, there are, you know, <laughs> domesticated animals you shouldn't do that with either. Um, yep. Yeah, like that's, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, the things that you need to, the skills you need to own. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's more than just the technical. Like when you're dealing with animals, like I, I think of myself, I mostly photograph people and events and, and weddings and portraits and things like that. And over the years, I feel like I've become pretty good student of body language and knowing people, but I wouldn't say that I could go out into the wild and like see an animal and be like, Oh, I kind of know what's going to happen here. You really have to become a student of their behavior and how they might move or, you know, what might spook them and you know, what you should and shouldn't do as a human being in their environment. Yeah. (laughs) So, in your opinion, what distinguishes, you know, a really good wildlife photograph from one that's just, I mean, kind of blah or ordinary? And like what elements or qualities make an image really stand out in this genre of photography? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different things, I think, that can like make or break a photo. Uh one huge one that uh, kind of immediately comes to my mind is composition. Uh, you know, you can kind of tell who knows what they're doing and who doesn't. Uh, something that I love to do when I shoot um, wildlife photography is not, you know, just stand at eye level. Uh, I pretty much never take a photo from my eye level when I'm shooting um, pretty much any sort of wildlife. I try to find like an angle uh, that most people aren't used to seeing that animal from, you know, because anyone can like, just stand and look at a rabbit or a deer or a turkey or any other animal for that matter. So uh, something that really comes to mind is when I photograph a rabbit, I always like I'm pretty much on my stomach anytime it happens, if I'm able to. And I get on the subject side level instead of my own because it really provides uh, a unique perspective to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I tell that to people who are talking about like want to take better pictures of their pets like you have to get on their level and you don't look at it from like standing up, looking at a dog, not that interesting, uh, yeah. get down on their level. looks, it's much more engaging as a photograph. And yeah, that's one of my common, uh, advice pieces of advice is always like, uh, change your perspective and you'll get a way better photo than like, don't just take it like standing there, like get, get low, yeah. get high up, do something, you know, that, that, that changes your perspective from what people normally see. Like you say, that's, if you're just standing at eye level, this is what people normally see all the time. That's how is it going to be interesting to them and grab their attention? Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, like things you should keep in mind, but like, how do you go about ensuring the safety of not just yourself, but the animals as well that you're photographing, like while still, like getting, you know, compelling photographs. Yeah. You you know, uh, this is one of those other huge things that like you kind of need to like do research on, uh, because an animal could be like feeding and they may only feed once a day. And if you show up during their feeding time and you scare them away, well, then they're not, you know, they're not going to get food for that day, which could lead to them not having as much energy, which could lead to a predator, you know, killing them. Uh, there's a lot of kind of causes and effects that you really need to take into consideration when photographing wildlife. Um, experience is another huge thing. You know, you're not doing research is one thing and it's great to do research, but I've learned so much more by actually personally observing the behaviors of animals. Um, and I've kind of learned what they're comfortable with and what they're not, which allows me to understand when they feel safe in their environment. And it helps keep me and them safe, you know, because I know, oh, this animal isn't going to charge at me, but I'm not going to terrify the animal and make it run away when it's eating its food or just grazing out in the field, you know? Right. Yeah. It's just like trying to be, again, you're, you're learning the behaviors of your subject, 
you know, yeah. I think that's a, I mean, a really important, anybody who's not shooting still lifes, you know, they, you, you, whatever you're photographing, if it's alive, you kind of need to learn behaviors and to keep yourself safe and to keep them safe. I think mean, it really hadn't something that hadn't uh, really dawned on me is like, you know, thinking about feeding times. Yeah. That could have a serious effect on, you know, an animal's well being. You know, I mean, it's kind of like you just you got to be courteous. Like I kind of think of it as like humans, you know, like we have like kind of manners, like you're not going to just like, you know, walk up to somebody while they're eating that you don't know and just sit down at the table and just like start eating off their plate. You know, it's it's kind of like a respect thing. Yeah. I mean, you respect like a, a don't have a tourist mentality, I guess would be the yeah. thought about like, you know, go in and that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Go. You're not just like jumping into somebody's house and right. just like you know you're not gonna turn over tables and you know like oh i gotta get in here and i gotta get one photo and then uh, i'm gonna leave yeah. um be re- being respectful and and understanding what your impact might be uh so that you are very careful about what you do so that you don't i mean there's always the like the hiking thing is like leave it better uh yeah but it, it, i think that it's that sort of mindset when you're out there with animals is to make sure that you're, yeah, you're not disturbing them and you're not disturbing their environment where they, where they might need to go and what they might need. So and we talked about various things and we, t- you mentioned you sh- you're shooting with a Nikon. Uh, what gear and equipment would you say is really in- essential to wildlife photography for people who are like thinking about, you know, getting into photographing wildlife. And are there any specific tools or accessories that you find like particularly useful? Because like that, these are things, again, it doesn't have to be camera gear. It could be things, other things that you know people might not consider. Like we were saying, you said about, you know, Oh, knowing the exposure triangle, but also behavior. Like these could be things outside of the technical uh, that most people might not think about. Right. So um, to start, you're going to you're going to need a camera with like relatively fast autofocus. Uh, If you get to the point where you're kind of serious about it, you know, you can start with a beginner DSLR. That's what I started with. And um, you can learn a lot with that. Um, You can learn a lot with a kit lens, you know, a 70 to 300 kit lens. You know, that's it's not a super telephoto lens, but 300 millimeters is considered a telephoto lens. Um, And it is pretty important to have a telephoto lens um, in order to get pretty close to your subject. Uh, Of course, there's environmental shots that you can get too with like a 70 to 200. I've used that before. Um, There's a lot of technical equipment that you're going to need. You know, I mean, a good sturdy tripod with like a wildlife gimbal, Um, especially when I spend like long hours out in the field, whether it be in a portable blind or like, you know, a traditional standard, like, wooden blind that um I, i'm not gonna like hold my camera the entire time but i also don't want it to like sit on the floor the entire time in case like i see an animal that pops up and i need to get a shot really fast so um a good sturdy heavy duty tripod is important um a heavy duty tripod i would almost say is more important than like a super fast like camera body because you you know like the li- here's here's how i would rank the technical gear in terms of importance i would do uh, a telephoto lens that's probably the most important thing you know i love my 200 to 500 but it doesn't have to be a super telephoto you can get great wildlife photos with a 200 millimeter a 300 millimeter you know it doesn't have to be like the longest and the best um then i would say you know you're gonna want a camera with relatively fast autofocus if you're serious about it um but then you're also gonna want a really heavy duty tripod um that's really important um, kind of moving away from uh, photography gear, there are a lot of other things that are important. Bug spray. Uh, <laughs> I cannot tell you the amount of times that I've been out in the field and I'm not put on bug spray and, you know, I'll get swarmed by flies and mosquitoes or I can even get ticks. Um, and that's rough. Nobody wants to deal with bug bites. Nobody <laughs> wants to deal with pulling ticks off of you. Um, yeah, that, that that's rough. Um Something else that is nice, uh, a lot of the times when I'm out in the field, the animals don't actually know I'm there. You know, there's there's scenarios like in Yellowstone where like um, a lot of the animals are like so familiar with people. They're not going to like run away like when they see you and like immediately be scared. Um, And that's great. But if you're in some isolated location like a farm in Kentucky like I am, wildlife is going to be scared when they see you. So camouflage is really important. I've invested a lot in camouflage. You know, I have camo shirts. I have camo pants, uh, short sleeves, long sleeves. I have camo jackets. I have a ghillie suit. I was going to get really serious (laughs) about it. Um, 
you know, it's really important to kind of blend in. And like if if you're shooting in some sort of snowy environment, you know, don't go like by traditional brown and green camo. You know, like they have like Arctic ghillie suits. They have Arctic camo, you know, just just blend in. That's really important. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, blending in is important. But I was also thinking about what you said about the tripod. It's I think it is the number one regret that most people have. I, I, I did a poll at one point, like, what's the a worst investment you ever made. And, every, and I think the number one answer was like, I bought a cheap tripod. Like yep. just go out and buy a good tripod for, at the beginning. It'll last a really long time. You're going to end up because all you're going to end up doing is like, you're going to, if you try to get like the cheapest tripod is then you're going to buy the cheap one. And then you're going to buy like the next level up and you're going to go, all right, well maybe this one will work better. And then that one won't work. And then you go out and you buy like the heavy duty, like solid tripod exactly and and, you know instead of just like wasting your money twice before you end up getting it just go out and buy the the heavy duty one to start with and and don't don't waste your money yeah it's it's especially going to be just like you're saying you don't want to be sitting out there holding your camera up all day you want to like yeah have it ready to go when you need it and you know those telephoto lenses are heavy you want to have something that can hold it up it's not tipping over on you yeah you know that's really going to upset the wildlife when they hear your gear crashing to the ground because you hear, you know, 200 to 500 goes slamming down. You know, also not really good for the gear. Uh, (laughs) Having something that, uh, (laughs) that can support the weight. So, all right. So what advice or tips would you have? for photographers who are thinking like, you know, I want to get into wildlife photography either as like a really passionate hobby or, you know, possibly as a career. For hobbyists, you know, I say just do it, you know, like get out with the camera that you have and just start shooting. You know, even if you just have a 24 to 70 millimeter lens, uh, you're not going to be able to get out and like get a really close up photo of a deer or um, a bird or anything like that. But you can go out in your yard and you can find insects, you know, you can find lizards, you can find uh, other sorts of wildlife that is like popular and literally like the backyards of the suburbs. And you can photograph those, you know, and that's a start. Learn about those animals, you know, kind of save up your money and then get a nicer lens if you don't have like a telephoto lens or anything. And then you can start shooting other animals and you can learn about other animals and you just kind of work your way up. Uh, for people who want to do something like this as a career, uh, I think it's really important to start creating passive income streams. You know, I have books, I've got prints, I have a variety of different kind of products that I sell that correlates uh, through my wildlife photography. Because, uh, because you know, when you shoot portraits, people are going to come to you and be like, hey, I want to book a photo shoot. And that's great. I love doing portraits. I take portraits myself. That's probably how I make um the majority of my income as well. But um, if you're wanting to shoot strictly wildlife photography, I, I think it's definitely important to come up with uh, revenue streams. You know, uh, it's it's important to be active on social media because how are you going to sell those prints? How are you going to sell those books? You know, like it, it's it's hard. Like <laughs> being a wildlife photographer is probably going to be one of the most difficult uh, niches of photography to actually have as a career and not just a hobby. Yeah. People aren't going to like come up and say like, Oh, here's 500 bucks. Go out and photograph yeah. some, uh, some bears for me. And and then I'll pay you more for the prints when you come back. That's exactly. not, not going to happen. You, you're like you said, like having a passive revenue stream is, is, you know, something that you need to establish from the beginning. You know, that's something that, you know, as someone who's, much further along in their photography career than and you, your work is very good. You, you've, you've, you've very accomplished for the number of years that you've been at this, but you know, something I wish I had learned when I was your age was to have those passive revenue streams and to have things yeah. that I didn't have to constantly be even in my line of, of photography to be constantly like out there, like, Oh, I got to get another job. I got to get another job. And when, like you said, the people aren't, commissioning you for these uh wildlife photos you need to have a way to to get in front a get your face in front of people and b uh sell them the product so any last thoughts before we finish up on on you know wildlife and uh nature photography 
you know, it, it's a great thing. I like to think that everybody should like, you know, go out and at least try it for once. You know, if you're into photography, I I mean, being out in nature for me, it's just like such a great feeling, whether I have a camera with me or not, like whether you live in the city or like out in the middle of nowhere, like there's going to be nature, like just go out and enjoy it. You know, you don't even have to have a camera. Most of the time you're going to see me with my camera, but you know, it's great to go out without it too. Uh, wildlife. There's just something about like looking into a wild animal's eyes. It's just like a feeling that you can't explain. And, you know, I want everybody to be able to feel that emotion kind of like, it's almost like you have an instant connection with that animal when you look into their eyes. Um, and I think everybody should feel that. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. And w- like you said, anywhere you go, you can find wildlife. And even like in New York, you, you, there are squirrels everywhere. There's lots of birds. There's lots of different birds. Or right, something that you had uh, mentioned uh, about uh, equipment in our in the last question I asked you, like people want to photograph things. That photographing insects is, I mean, inc- can be incredibly interesting and not like difficult. Where you can pretty much do that. Anywhere in the world, anywhere you are, you can definitely if you want to like sort of break the ice into uh, wildlife photography. Like that's a great place to start. Hello there, nerdy photographer listeners. Do you have a website, or do you need one? Well, let me tell you, you should be using SiteGround to host your website. I used different hosts for many, many years, and I dealt with so many problems: terrible support slow loading speeds, all sorts of attacks on my site that I couldn't deal with. But when I switched to SiteGround, my problems have gone away. I haven't had to worry about my site once in the five years that I've been using SiteGround. And right now you can get 80% off hosting and a free transfer of your website. Hosting can start from as low as $2.99 a month. $2.99 a month. That's so cheap and it's so good. I wouldn't recommend it to you if I didn't use it myself. Head over to nerdyphotographer.com slash recommends slash site ground. That's nerdyphotographer.com slash recommends slash S-I-T-E-G-R-O-U-N-D. Or you can click on the link in the episode notes and get over there. 80% off hosting and a free transfer. You're not going to regret it. Hey, photographers, are you tired of using the same stale poses with your clients, resulting in stiff and unnatural photos? Consider using Let's Be Real prompts instead. Prompts are not just a list of poses. They're designed to help you create a more engaging, fun environment for your photo subjects, resulting in more natural and authentic images. With Nerdy Photographers Let's Be Real prompts, you'll have a unique set of prompts for couples, weddings, families, and individuals, ensuring that you never run out of ideas. Prompts are particularly helpful for clients who are nervous or self-conscious about having their picture taken. By giving them something else to focus on, they can become more relaxed and their reactions will be more authentic and less guarded. Using Let's Be Real prompts will not only help you create more fresh and dynamic images, but it will also increase your confidence and your client's confidence in you. You'll be able to handle difficult situations and subjects with ease, resulting in more satisfied clients and a stronger photography business. So start using Let's Be Real prompts from the Nerdy Photographer today and elevate your photography to the next level. Go to nerdyphotographer.com and go to our store or click the link in the episode notes and get started creating authentic, engaging images today. Hey, hey, hey. And now for my favorite part of the show. What's that say? Useless information. Ugh. This is always death. Rylan, did you know that flamingos can only eat with their head upside down? Wow, I I did not know that. That's very fascinating. Yeah, when they dip their head into the water, that's how they they eat with their head upside down. It's the only way that they can uh, eat food. They can't do it. It's really cool. It's just, well, it's one of those, you know, nature finds, you know, finds a way and what works best like that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being on. Where can people find you online and elsewhere? Yeah, you can go to www.rylandsamazingphotography.com. Uh, pretty much you can find me uh, on any social media. Just type in Rylan's Amazing Photography on my website. You can find prints. You can find my new book to you from me. Uh, it's got all sorts of different pictures of wildlife, birds, landscapes, um, all sorts of different stuff in it. And I worked really hard on it. If anybody wants to check that out. 
Well, thank you very much, Ryland. I really appreciate you coming on uh, and come back anytime you want. Like, let me know if there's anything you want to talk about or I'll definitely reach out to you. Thank you very Sounds much. Great. Thanks for having me. Welcome back, everyone. Don't worry. Golden and I are okay for the moment. Looks like we lost those shark wolf things. I hope you enjoyed my talk with Ryland Meadows. Be sure to check the episode notes for links to Ryland's website, socials, and his book. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and follow our socials. I have live Q&As as well as lots of other fun stuff going on between episodes. You can follow along at The Nerdy Photo on Instagram, TikTok, and Threads. And there are other links in the episode notes as well. Snug. They're coming back around. Okay, let's get ready to move. Until next time, everybody, stay safe and stay nerdy. Thank you.